Hello everyone and welcome to today's presentation on Hewitt's Revolutionary War Sawmill and Dam at the Lillian Place Heritage Center. My name is Ed Sharkovich. I'm the president of the Flagler County Historical Society and the program developer for Hewitt's Sawmill at the Florida Agricultural Museum. I'll be showing my contact information again at the end of today's talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me anytime. This is a photo of me, just so you know who's talking to you. History is everywhere. Historic artifacts are showing up where you would least expect them, even on Facebook Marketplace. Anyone want a Kmart bench for $5,000? Florida's history is both extensive and amazing. Florida's archaeological record has revealed some amazing finds from giant ground sloths, saber-toothed tigers, and mastodons and woolly mammoths like these that can be found at the Florida Historical Society's museum in Brevard County. To this amazingly preserved spear point found in January of this year in Flagler County, which is estimated to be between five and seven thousand years old. There is no doubt that Florida history would be changed altogether with the arrival of the Spanish in 1565. What was seemingly a good trading opportunity for indigenous cultures turned into a much different story as subsequent groups of Europeans found their way to the New World. Spain hung on to Florida for almost 200 years. In 1763, England took Florida over from Spain, placing St. Augustine, seen with the Blue Star, right in the middle of their 33 colonies that stretched from Nova Scotia, the Yellow Star, down to Grenada, the Red Star. When England took over, they partitioned Florida into two sections, East Florida, the Peninsula, and West Florida, the Panhandle. In 1765, King George III appointed German-born William Gerard de Brom as the British Master Surveyor of the 13 colonies. De Brom was a map-making genius with unparalleled accuracy. A de Brom map could be placed on top of a modern-day satellite image with perfect alignment. The map pictured on the right measures 5 feet wide by 20 feet long. In 1767, de Brom is working his way through modern-day Flagler County, southwest of Matanzas Inlet. He comes across a notable feature of a northward-running creek that empties into the Little Matanza River. The creek's banks are 30 feet high, and he makes note that if the creek was dammed, it would make an ideal place for a sawmill. On his map, he writes, fit place for a mill. This fit place for a mill is located on present-day Hewlett's Branch, one mile south of Pelosier Creek on US-1, and immediately to the west of the Florida Agricultural Museum. In 1768, master carpenter John Elliott Hewitt arrives in St. Augustine, the capital of the 14th colony. He makes a name for himself by building the steeple on the British church and through his work on the governor's mansion and government house. In 1769, de Brom's map is released and Hewitt sees the fit place for a mill site just off the newly constructed King's Road. He buys the site along with 1,000 acres of cypress, longleaf pine, and live oak. In 1770, he uses enslaved labor to construct a dam and brings in a German crew of mill builders. The sawmill is water-driven with wooden gears and a reciprocating blade. The design is state-of-the-art and efficient. Prior to mechanized sawmills, a two-person pit crew could cut 200 feet of lumber per day. John Hewitt's sawmill could produce 1,500 feet of lumber per day. As John Hewitt's enslaved workforce cuts the wood that builds houses and ships in St. Augustine, turmoil continues to build in the 13 colonies to the north. In 1766, colonists begin to boycott taxed British goods. In 1768, these boycotts increase. In 1773, the Boston Tea Party occurs. In 1774, boycott violators are slandered and their businesses are vandalized, and then in 1775, the Boston Massacre, Lexington and Concord, and the battles of Fort Ticonderoga and Bunker Hill take place. 
July 4th, 1776, the Declaration of Independence is signed and the Revolutionary War is on. The news of the signing of the Declaration of Independence reaches St. Augustine three months later, and the British are outraged. Effigies of Samuel Adams and John Hancock are hung from trees and burned in the town square. East Florida and St. Augustine remain loyal to King George III, and the 13 colonies are declared traitors. Meanwhile, in the 13 colonies, British loyalists are declared traitors, and those who do not swear allegiance to the patriots have their businesses destroyed, plantations burned, and many are tarred and feathered. These actions create widespread panic among the Loyalists, and nearly 22,000 of them flee the 13 colonies and head to St. Augustine. So great was the panic that 13 ships sink trying to get into St. Augustine Harbor during a nor'easter. St. Augustine's population swells from 4,000 to 26,000, causing a housing crisis as Loyalists live in wagons and tents waiting for the British to suppress the rebellion so that they can return to their lives. John Hewitt's sawmill ramps up, cutting 1,500 feet of lumber per day to meet the housing crisis. The Treaty of Paris is signed on September 3, 1783, and the American Revolutionary War is over. The British in St. Augustine begin to realize that they will not be returning to their properties in the newly formed United States. Then 1784 comes. England trades Florida back to Spain for Gibraltar. Spain tells the British Floridians to convert to Catholicism and swear their allegiance to the King of Spain or leave. Many of them leave and head to Nova Scotia, the Caribbean, and the British West Indies. We know at this time that John Hewitt is deceased. His wife leaves for Nassau in the Bahamas. Spain has a difficult time regaining control of Florida during the Second Spanish Occupation. During the little talked about Patriot War of 1812, the U.S. begins to push across the border into Florida. A U.S. military detachment from Georgia comes across the Hewitt Sawmill and finding it in, quote, a state of dereliction, axes it to pieces and burns it to the ground so that Spain cannot use it to expand its hold in Florida. Fast forward 167 years. Archaeologist William Jones searches for the Hewitt Dam on old maps and finds it in 1979. Excavations reveal the sawmill's floor and timbers that show evidence of destructive axe marks and fire. From found evidence and artifacts, he builds a scale model of the sawmill. A scientific paper is written on Hewitt Sawmill and is published in the St. Augustine Historical Society's El Escribano Journal. Further work is done in the early 2000s by archaeologist Dana St. Clair, and the sawmill is turned into an archaeological park under the ownership of the Florida Agricultural Museum. In 2010, the Old Kings Highway chapter of the Daughters of the American Revolution places a historic marker on the site and the park is open for self-guided tours. Then, absolutely nothing happens. Poor management by the Florida Agriculture Museum leadership and Hurricanes Matthew and Irma leave the site in a state of dereliction once again. Suddenly the year is 2018 and I find myself in a small Flagler Beach cafe. The next table over is this guy, Flagler County historian and the author of seven books on Flagler County history, Bill Ryan. I overhear him talking about this forgotten Revolutionary War era sawmill site, which causes me to make the biggest mistake of my life, and I ask him a question. That answer led me to an introduction to the new Florida Agricultural Museum leadership. I toured the site and developed a plan to rehabilitate the sawmill park and reopen it for tours. The plan was accepted in December of 2018, and in January of 2019, we began work. A total of 80 volunteers from local groups participated. Trees were removed, 
trails were cleared and manicured, bridges and structures were repaired, and new signs and benches were installed. A historian tour was given to local experts from both Flagler and St. John's counties, and their knowledge and stories were recorded and turned into a historical tour script. On June 26th of 2019, the first ever guided tour of Hewitt's Sawmill and Dam was given to Paws of War, Florida, comprised of 28 veterans and their service dogs. Three days later, on June 29th at 10 a.m., a rededication ceremony was given with bagpipers marching across the dam and speeches that retold the story of the site during the time of the founding of the United States. At 7 p.m. that night, a Patriot Night Watch was held. Reenactor guides led guests around the trail where they were greeted by St. Augustine's East Florida Governor Tonin, East Florida Rangers, and a second Spanish occupation soldier who told everyone to either convert or get out. On September 21, 2019, for National Museum Day, we had our first ever history demonstration, courtesy of sawmill foreman Johann Sepp, portrayed by Preston Zepp. In the true spirit of synergism, Preston is a colonial woodworking historian whose family came to the colonies from Germany in the 1750s as sawmill builders. How do you like that? Guided only tours continued from that point forward right up until the COVID-19 pandemic put the big crunch on everybody. So now what? Now we teach them. This is all about them. Our children are craving knowledge and human interaction that will never be satisfied by the solitary isolation of electronic devices. Kids and their parents need to be educated on accurate historical facts, life skills, and work ethics in order for our country to remain globally competitive. There are many studies that show that history immersion experiences are the most effective means of attaining this. They need to know stuff. Many don't know that three signers of the Declaration of Independence were held captive in St. Augustine, or that on July 4th, 1781, they were released from prison in the Castillo de San Marcos and celebrated the first Independence Day in British-occupied Florida with an order of plum pudding topped with a makeshift Betsy Ross flag singing God Save These 13 States to the tune of God Save King George III. The British were not amused. People also need to know that there were men like Polish General General Tadeusz Kosciuszko, who fought not only for American independence, but for the freedom of slaves. On his deathbed in Poland after the Revolutionary War, Kosciuszko instructed his friend and executor of his estate, Thomas Jefferson, to sell Kosciuszko's American assets and take the money to buy Jefferson's slaves their freedom. We all need to hear the story of William Gerard de Brom, who upon discovering that his maps were being used to relocate Native Americans from their lands so that resources could be exploited, declared global imperialism a religious sin. He penned letters to King George III and the kings of Portugal and Spain, telling them that they were going to hell for destroying the spirits of fellow human beings. There are many historic sites that are in jeopardy of being lost. General Hernandez's St. Joseph's Plantation in modern-day Flagler County now sits beneath an ABC liquor store and Publix supermarket. When these sites are gone, they can no longer teach the good and bad of history to develop awareness and build character. The Flagler County Historical Society is working against the clock to save two historic sites that sit in juxtaposition to Hewitt's 1770 sawmill and dam. To the northwest is an original stretch of King's Road dating to 1767. To the northeast is Fort Fulton, an 1840 Seminole War Fort that guarded King's Road and the back door to St. Augustine. We're working on a plan to create the King's Road Historic District that would unify Hewitt's sawmill owned by the Florida Agricultural Museum 
with the Kings Road and Fort Fulton sites owned by Rainier Timber and St. John's River Water Management. The proposed district sits at the top of a phase of northward creeping development that will surely explode as we begin to come out of the COVID-19 pandemic. The goal is to create a living history teaching facility that will allow historians to teach on the actual dirt that the history occurred on. We need your help. To receive a copy of the plan, give me a call or send me an email. Letters of endorsement and participation of everybody will help us to make this plan come to fruition to teach those that will come after us. There is always strength in numbers. As historians, we need to come together as colorblind, nonpartisan educators to get the knowledge we have in our heads into the minds of the future before it's too late. Respectfully, I say to you that every time an old person dies, it's like a library burning to the ground. Knowledge is gone forever. Together, we can make a difference. In Flagler County, we have put together the Flagler County History Roundtable. Consisting of 15 local history groups and museums, we have formed a local partnership to save and promote history and education, and we are looking to strengthen our numbers with all of you. That's it. We've got a lot of other projects happening at the Flagler County Historical Society, including expanded history bus tours and the formation of a Florida Women's Voting Rights Museum. To get in touch with me, send me a text at 386-338-7231 or an email at dred32080 at yahoo.com. I really appreciate the invitation to present to you today, and I look forward to seeing you in person at a future point in time.